Welcome, my friends. I'm Mini Pride from Milk and Cookies Total War, and this Leviathan of a 40k series continues right meow, just as planned. But we're shifting gears a little bit. I've spent three full videos talking about why it's not only possible, but why it's logical for Creative Assembly to enter the 40k market sometime in the next several years, and what a Warhammer 40,000 Total War game might look like as it follows in the path forged by mortal empires. But that's not what we're doing here today. This video isn't about convincing you of anything. If you want to hear my previous arguments and primer content, go check out my introduction debate and collabs with Italian Spartacus. There's hours worth of content there already, and in it, I lay the groundwork for why I think 40k Total War should and will eventually happen. Now, this is all about the factions we will see if and when it does come to pass. So today will be the start of a very slow trickle, because we're still a long ways off, but if this YouTube channel still exists, and if we aren't all old and gray or turned to ash by nuclear war by the time this series finally gets announced, then that trickle will turn into a flood when Total War Warhammer 40k officially enters the mortal plane. And for the first of our faction-focused videos, we'll be shining the spotlight on one of my personal favorite Chaos Space Marine Legions, the Thousand Sons of Zeech, the Psychic Scourge of Chaos. And with the might of 1,000 Psychers, they breach the dam between reality and the Immaterium, pouring forth in a tide of violence and madness to set worlds ablaze beneath their implacable march. Theirs is a legion shaped by the mutating energy of the warp and imbued with sorcerer's power in the name of the Great Deceiver, a corrupted cabal that hopes to transform this galaxy into a realm of waking nightmares. Chanting all is dust as they tear apart their enemies with lightning from their eyes and inferno bolters from their ass, the only thing they fear in this universe is the almighty vacuum cleaner. And with an aesthetic, naming conventions, and lore that harken back to the pharaohs of ancient Egypt on Terra, they are an incredibly unique and visually stunning faction with some crazy special rules and units, which we'll get into later in this video. But they were not always enthralled to the Raven God, they were once staunch loyalists of the Imperium. Their tale, and the tale of their Primarch Magnus the Red, is a tragedy of proportions so epic it would make Bill Shakespeare blush, and their downfall, followed by their equally dramatic rise to power in the eyes of the Great Deceiver, makes for a pretty dang compelling narrative that we could talk about for hours and barely scratch the surface. But we'll do our best here. This is a legion turned from the light of the Emperor, once great scholars and collectors of knowledge, now cruelly molded into robotic voids of power armor and emptiness. A legion that has lost all hope and purpose, and as the days slip into millennia, only battle reminds them of the glories their past held, and the endless service that awaits them in the future. So we'll do an overview of the Thousand Suns' history and lore, explain their identity and their role in the galaxy at large, then discuss their unique stratagems, legendary lords, units, aesthetic, and how they might translate to the battlefields of Total War. Let's get into it. And in the fires of the Great Crusade, humanity's grand expansion throughout the stars, the Emperor of Mankind, Gene, forged 20 supreme beings to lead his legions in his reclamation of the galaxy. These Primarchs and their champions embodied all the greatest strengths and the greatest weaknesses of humanity. Superhuman speed, strength, endurance, and intelligence, closer to gods than mortal men in physicality and charisma, and superhuman egos to go alongside it. And each of these Primarchs embodied a different set of ideals and ability, shaped by their vastly different upbringings and by the genetic markers that comprise their immortal flesh and blood. And in the case of Magnus the Red, it was psychic potential and an unquenchable thirst for knowledge that made him who he was. He was a big, fat nerd. I'm sure a lot of you guys can empathize. But while all that stuff was true, he was also a 10 foot tall genetic freak with a body chiseled like a Greek god, a glorious mane of blood red hair, and copper skin. He kind of sticks out in a crowd. But after the Chaos Gods played their hand and scattered these Primarchs across the void to plant the seeds for their eventual Galactic Coming Out party, Magnus the Red landed upon a world called Prospero, where a commune of psychers lived in perpetual fear. Their limited, almost childlike understanding of witchcraft and the Immaterium had made them pray for a race of mindless Xenos called the Psychnuin, massive, parasitic warp bees that would lay their eggs in the minds of unwary psychers, with catastrophic implications. Think chestbursters from Alien, but they crawl out of your freaking mouth. Yeah, welcome to life in the Milky Way galaxy, where getting shot by your commissar for a quick morale boost is the most pleasant way to die. So with his help, the threat posed by these warp creatures was almost entirely eradicated, immolated from the skies, and Prospero became a flourishing paradise world of knowledge and learning, even before the Emperor was reunited with his long-lost son. Like all the other Space Marine Legions, the Thousand Sons didn't meet their Gene Father until the Master of Mankind brought them to their Primarch's homeworld. They were the 15th of 20 legions meant to scour the Milky Way galaxy, 
and their reunion with Magnus, a father they had never met before, was a joyous occasion, as was the meeting between Magnus and the Emperor, whose psychic abilities had allowed them to converse many times over before they finally came face to face. But all was not well, because when Magnus was reunited with his legion, he quickly discovered their gene seed was marked by a fatal flaw, an aberration that would come to be known as the Flesh Change. Essentially, if a Thousand Suns Psyker and their use of the warp became too free-flowing, too unrestrained, or if a spell was simply too powerful to wield, they might spontaneously combust and mutate into an abomination. Little did they know at the time, but these would be amongst the first recorded glimpses of Chaos Spawn in the galaxy at large. And this made them untrustworthy in the eyes of other legions, which makes sense when you think about it. No matter how well-intentioned or how powerful one's army might be on the battlefield, if your ally has a chance of rolling a one and turning into a gibbering freak of nature with no self-control and boundless rage, you might not want to work with them in the future. So Magnus toiled to find a cure for his rapidly depleting forces, ultimately coming into contact with an aspect of Zeench, the Raven God, and in so doing, unknowingly damned his legion for eternity trading his own eye for the knowledge to save his sons. Only 1,000 space marines survived this transition, but their gene seed was stabilized and they began recruiting once again, slowly rebuilding their numbers. But even at their peak, they had considerably less Astartes than others of their kind. In fact, in the wars to come, they would be utterly dwarfed in manpower compared to their brothers in the Ultramarines, Word Bearers, or Dark Angels, which shouldn't have been a problem, right? On paper, they're probably the strongest original Space Marine Legion, just completely OP. They have all the intelligence, training, tactics, and equipment of the others, while also being innate psychers with the power to explode people with a snap of their finger, slice them in half with mind bullets, boil their blood, or otherwise discombobulate and disembowel their opposition with but a single thought. Whereas other legions had a librarian division for psychers, a small number of gifted individuals begrudgingly accepted by the Emperor and their kin, the Thousand Sons were their librarian division. It was only a small percentage of their forces that had no innate psychic powers whatsoever. And as I said, this bred trust issues between Magnus and the other Primarchs. More on that in a little bit. At the very heart of their legion was an occult hierarchy comprised of five different aspects that symbolized the collective pillars of arcane knowledge. And that was what Magnus was all about, spreading knowledge and mastery of these enumerations and achieving nirvana through focused mental discipline and meditation, gaining mastery over oneself and their etheric form. And to do this, the Thousand Sons used tutelaries, a form of kindred spirit and familiar that would amplify and focus their powers. Wouldn't be until many years later that their more malicious nature was truly revealed, but that will come later down the line. And in this hierarchy were five cults of learning and knowledge. The Pyrae, Corvidae, Athenians, Raptora, and Pavoni. And Thousand Suns legionaries would be divided amongst these cults according to whichever set of powers they showed the most affinity towards. The Athenians were telepaths, able to read minds and communicate vast distances without need of equipment or a vox, shaping the legion's battlefield tactics on the fly to counter their opposition. You can imagine the strategic implications that might afford when you know what the enemy is doing at the same time they do. Now, the Corvidae were gifted with the abilities of precognition, able to see into the future, manipulating events to forge more favorable outcomes and were arguably the most powerful and most ascended of the bunch, until the Chaos Gods actively began clouding their minds. Much like they did with Sanguinius or the Emperor, they prevented visions of the future from fully manifesting in their minds to avoid any possible ruination of their plans with Horus. The Pavoni were students of an art known as physiokinesis, able to heal grievous wounds with their minds, unleash massive electrical storms, or explode the hearts of their enemies by boiling their blood inside their bodies. The Pyrae were pyrokinetics, with absurd control over flame and fire, creating vortexes of pure heat, shooting fireballs from their hands, and forcing Xenos to spontaneously combust on impact. And they also learned to control machine systems with their minds as well, utilizing robots from the Legio Cybernetica, and even Titans like the Warlord-class Canis Vertex to do their bidding on the battlefield. And the Raptora were the final major cult prior to the Horus Heresy, and they were psychers with a foundation built on telekinesis, able to fling massive objects vast distances, or create barriers of pure psychic energy known as Kind Shields, that would hold up even under orbital bombardment. Think about that for a second. If you want an understanding of just how stupid powerful the Thousand Suns were, they could survive world-ending weaponry by generating force fields with their minds. 
No wonder the Dark Gods wanted them to team up with Horus when it came time for his rebellion. But the process of converting them would be a long, arduous, and Zinchian path through the Labyrinth of Time, driving wedges of doubt and mistrust at every single turn. Just as planned, in a manner only the changer of ways could possibly foresee. To set the stage for this next part, one has to understand Primarchs a little bit more in depth. These are demigods, superheroes essentially, juiced to the gills in terms of strength, speed, endurance, reflexes, and brain power. Everything about them is comically, cosmically impressive. But Primarchs are not sympathetic characters. They are, almost without fail, incredibly flawed, emotionally stunted, rash, childish, easily misled, proud, and arrogant. And these deficiencies would prove to be fatal in more ways than one. Not just for their own selves, but for those around them as well. No matter how well-intentioned, no matter how loyal, their own oversized egos and lack of awareness force a lot of rather grim dark things to happen that could have been easily avoided by a regular human with a modicum of empathy. And it makes sense when you think about it, because the Emperor himself was much the same way. He was a hypocrite, a demagogue, a creature of almost limitless psychic potential and knowledge, but too pompous and disconnected from reality to see the forest for the trees. That his very own actions and lack of emotional depth were building towards a galactic civil war. There's a pretty stupid and unfortunately common trope about how Magnus did nothing wrong, that he was blameless in the events that were to follow, but Magnus was a Primarch, and to be a Primarch was to be a big bumbling failure. And, well, he screwed the pooch in more ways than one. Now the Space Wolves and the Primarch Lehman Russ already had serious reservations with Magnus and the Thousand Sons, and considering they had already been the Emperor's executioner for at least one of the Lost Legions, and come to blows against Angren and the World Eaters at Genna, and probably had a lot of other run-ins that we've never heard of before, they clearly had no qualms with killing brother Space Marines. They had done it before, they would do it again. We won't get into the gigantic, world-consuming ego and utter hypocrisy of the Space Wolves and their king here, but suffice to say, in their eyes, Fenris magic good, Thousand Suns magic bad. Wolf and mutants and turning into Fenrisian wolves fine, turning into Chaos Spawn, not fine. So on the planet of Arkreach Segundus, after a brutal campaign prosecuted by Magnus, Lorgar, and Lehman Russ, when the Space Wolves saw foul Thousand Suns sorcery turn a legionnaire into a Chaos Spawn, they said, enough is enough. We're telling Big Daddy Emps and shutting this hoe down once and for all. No more psychers, except for ours, of course, because, you know, we're special. Woof, woof. You can tell I love Space Wolves. And that discussion, which had already been brewing for a very long time within the Imperium, because the Emperor was well aware of the dangers posed by unrestrained psychers, finally came to a head, and it led directly to the Council of Nikea, where the Librarian Divisions and Mage Cults within each and every founding Space Marine chapter were utterly dismantled, and where the Emperor himself forbade all magic from ever being used again. To break this treaty would be considered treachery of the highest order, and in the coming years, most Primarchs and their children listened, and they listened well. In fact, many already had an innate distaste for Psychers and their powers, like Mortarion and the Death Guard. And it was legions like these that testified against Magnus at Nikea. Later on, during the battle for Kalth, Robot Girly Man, the Primarch of the Ultramarines, noted just how convenient it was that humanity had lost its most powerful weapon against demons, just as the Horus Heresy was about to take shape. Again, likely engineered by Zinch, just as planned, Mother Truckers. But while some legions were utterly enthused by the dismantling of the Librarius, and the fact that we wouldn't be able to use Psychers anymore, others didn't really listen at all. The White Scars and the Khan had no intention of stripping the Stormseers of their power. The Space Wolves thought it didn't apply to them whatsoever, because they said their power came from Fenris, not the Warp, which was utter bullcrap. And for the Thousand Suns, well, it effectively neutered their legion and was seen as a massive betrayal of all they stood for, all they had accomplished as the Sons of Magnus. And make no mistake, as the strongest human psyker after the Emperor, one of the most gifted psychic beings in the known universe, Magnus was crushed that his impassioned plea at Nikea went ignored, that his thirst for knowledge that he shared for the good of the Imperium was being utterly stifled. It'd be like if you were a cheetah chained up in a cage and unable to run, or an eagle without wings. Magnus was a peacock, you gotta let him fly, and the Emperor was screwing with him royally with the Edict of Nikia, so for obvious reasons, it was mostly ignored by the Thousand Sons as well. 
up until the point the Crimson King caught wind of Horus and his coming rebellion, and then he really ignored it. Now on a surface level, yeah, they kind of went along with the flow, but if you went into the chambers of Mr. Cyclops Man or any of his cults, the boys in blue were absolutely still practitioners of the Dark Arts, and it really never left their legion. So, decades prior to all of this going down, at the triumph on Ulanor after crushing the biggest Greenskins incursion in human history, one of the greatest threats to humankind ever, the Master of Mankind withdrew from his role on the front line, named Horus Warmaster of the Imperium, and retreated to Terra to work on stuff in secret. This secret was the Golden Throne, his Webway project, his crowning achievement as the leader of humankind. Now this was technology left over from the Dark Age that would allow for instantaneous interstellar travel between worlds, making the inherently dangerous navigation of warp travel utterly obsolete. Same tech the Eldar used to get around the galaxy before and after their fall. And if successful, the Milky Way and its millions of worlds would be truly united as never before. It would have brought about the true ascendance of man, the greatest technological breakthrough in human history. Life-changing stuff. Which was not what the Chaos Gods wanted. They benefited from humanity being as separated as possible, cut off from the light of their emperor. So, they planted a seed, granting Magnus a vision of the truth, that Horus had been laid low on the plague moon of Davin by the Anatheme, that he was now corrupted by the Chaos Gods, and was planning to betray the Imperium at the Istvan system, chopping the heads off three loyalist legions in a single brutal stroke. Literally. Rest in peace, sweet Ferris Manus, we hardly knew ye. And this freaked Magnus out, of course, because even though he was very much wounded by the Council of Nikea, he was still a staunch loyalist and a fan of his daddy, so he did the only thing he felt he could. First, he tried to reach out to Horus, sacrificing many of his own serfs to psychically fling his essence through the void to the War Master many millions of light years away, where he lay in a coma, recovering from the blessed blade of Nurgle that had pierced his body. But Erebus, goddamn Erebus, that dirty slut, and the Chaos Cult of Davin deflected Magnus' psychic intrusion, and he was unable to make headway with his brother. So, Magnus turned his attention towards the homeworld of Terra, realizing he couldn't stop what was coming, he could only hope to contain it. Stuff was happening way too quickly at this point, it would have taken months, if not years, to return home and warn the Emperor of this coming Horus heresy via warp travel, and honestly, the Dark Gods probably would not have allowed a ship to survive that jump anyway. Their entire plan was predicated on what came next, and standard warp travel was not going to be on their agenda. Anyone who attempted it to warn the Emperor of what was coming would have probably died anyway. So, the Thousand Sons created an even bigger ritual, and once again, the Spirit of Magnus the Red entered the warp, flying towards the Emperor, intent on explaining the coming treachery, that half of the Imperium's military forces were about to kickstart a civil war, galaxy-wide. Pretty big deal there, likely an event the Emperor might want to know about, but the problem was, the force required to propel his radiant spirit millions of light years in an instant was momentous. So powerful, in fact, that it shattered the psychic wards the Emperor had been building for the last several centuries. And in an instant, one horrific, terrible moment, all the Emperor's work was undone. The Golden Throne lay in ruins, and the Demons of Chaos were granted access to the webway, where they quickly swarmed in and slaughtered all who worked inside it, threatening to overrun Holy Terra itself. The Sisters of Silence and Adeptus Custodes, the two elite bodyguard regiments of the Emperor, would be forced to fight a running war in the webway against a never-ending tide of chaos for the next five years, while the damage wrought by Magnus could finally be repaired. And 10,000 years later, it is this very rift that the demons threatened to swallow whole in their bid to consume Terra, should the Emperor ever be removed from his throne. So yeah, Magnus screwed up pretty bad, and he realized it the second he did it. He saw in the eyes of his father a future that would never come to pass, a future where he powered the Golden Throne and her sister device, the Dark Glass, soaring through the webway on a grand adventure commanding the forces of the Imperium. A future without demons or the predations of chaos, but his present was a prison of his own making. And after realizing he had just unleashed 10,000 years of hell on Terra, he retreated into himself forgoing his legion, and becoming one sad, depressed little Primarch. In fact, he feels so bad about it, that when the Space Wolves come knocking, burning his homeworld to ash, he doesn't do anything about it. Well, actually, no, let me rephrase that. He's so devastated, so utterly racked with guilt, he actively hinders any attempts to avoid the coming conflict. 
He is fully aware the dogs of Rust are gathering to invade Solar weeks before it actually happens, and doesn't warn his Legion or the people of Prospero at all. Just lets it all unfold, preferring to let the punishment play out rather than be seen as a traitor. Magnus actually goes so far as to kill one of his own sons about two weeks before the invasion when he realizes what's coming and threatens to warn the others. Not very cash money of our boy the Crimson King. Now for their part, the Space Wolves are entirely too easy to go into action here. Horus whispers sweet nothings in Lehman Russ's ear, stoking the hatred he has for Magnus and his thousand sons, reminding him of their conflict at Arkreach Segundus, and twisting the words of the Emperor in bringing Magnus to heal. Obviously, the Emperor did not want Magnus or the Thousand Sons dead, nor did he want Prospero burned to ash, but he did want the Legion to answer for their idiocy, which is why sending the Space Wolves was the dumbest possible move, one of many the Emperor makes when it comes to his sons. Only the World Eaters with the Butcher's Nail still singing in their skulls could have possibly been a worse choice, and honestly, the World Eaters are probably smarter than the Wolves even with their lobotomies. But yeah, Horus shows his absolute brilliance here, and this is one of the main reasons why he was chosen as Warmaster, because he's not only a brilliant warlord, but a brilliant tactician and leader of men, and his judgment of character is second to none amongst the Primarchs. He realized without a shadow of a doubt that Magnus would not turn willingly to chaos, so he takes a calculated risk, gambling on the outright obliteration of Prospero and the Thousand Sons, that if there were survivors, they would join the other traitor legions, because they had nowhere else to go. And he was right. So in terms of that age-old meme about Magnus doing nothing wrong, yeah, it's pretty stupid. I mean, he psychically blocks all communication from the Space Wolves fleet to Prospero down below when they show up, doing so for more than an hour as Lehman Russ and Constantine Valdor await a response in the void. There were a million and one ways to avoid the coming conflict. The subsequent orbital bombardment, the dropship invasion, the fight for Tizka's City of Light, and the burning of Prospero. But none of them come to pass. A simple conversation between the two Primarchs would have been hugely beneficial for starters, but Magnus was too busy pouting to even attempt diplomacy. This whole situation was basically the Falcons losing to the Patriots in Super Bowl 51, when they were up 28 to 3. Literally every single thing that could have gone wrong went wrong. If one single chip fell differently, if one single player acted in a manner other than how they did, crisis could have likely been averted. Instead, the two legions never make contact, and an orbital bombardment opens up from the heavens, glassing the planet and destroying everything on Prospero but the capital city of Tizka, where the Thousand Suns and the heart of their cults are waiting for a fight. The only thing that keeps the pyramids and the capital standing is a massive kind shield generated by the psychers of the Raptora cult, and realizing they can't penetrate the shield, Lehman Russ makes landfall, leading a ground war straight towards Magnus and his great library. Now, I could go on for like an hour and a half about the battle itself, but I'll keep it short and sweet. Azak Ariman, the chief librarian of the Corvidae and Magnus the Red's right-hand man, leads a brilliant defense of the city, destroys a bunch of barbarians with facts and logic, and his homie Colophis uses his pyre powers to take control of the warlord titan Canis Vertex, absolutely demolishing huge sections of the invasion force with fiery bolts of burning, before ultimately losing control of the titan and going nuclear in the middle of downtown. And everything's actually going okay, all things considered, until the flesh chain strikes back, where Zinj plays his dirty games once again, and one by one, until it was a straight up pandemic running through the streets, our brave protagonists start splitting and shifting and mutating into Spawn of Chaos, overwhelmed by the sheer outpouring of magical energy they've been forced to use. They're driven further and further back, losing more and more of their number as they move towards the final pyramid of Tizka. And then along came Zeus. Like a thunderbolt from the heavens, Magnus the Red shows up and he just starts blasting. Kills like a thousand space wolves and custodes and Sisters of Silence, turns a bunch of wolf and dumbasses into fried eggs, and then meets Lehman Russ in man-to-man, -man, mano e mano combat. A battle of two of the most powerful beings in the universe. And in a normal situation, I think Magnus would crush this fight. I think objectively, he's the Primarch with the highest ceiling and damage output overall. They are all innate or latent psychers, they are all amazing combatants, and some of them are certainly better in close quarters than the Crimson King, but this is THE innate psyker, arguably the second most powerful non-deity in the universe when it comes to psychic potential. But his heart isn't truly in this fight. 
he still fancies himself a loyalist. So, Lehman Russ breaks Magnus's back over his knee, and after issuing a final warning, the wolves will forever be haunted by the fact that they executed the wrong legion, Magnus teleports Tizka, a literal city, and all of its survivors to a brand new vacation spot. Sorciaris, the planet of the sorcerers. I'll give you five guesses where that is. Yeah, the Eye of Terror. It's a demon world, and from there, the path to ruination and eternal servitude in the name of Zinch was all but complete. The Thousand Suns exile world is quite literally crowned by the howling spirits of those who died by deceit. A far future Dante's Inferno, the eighth and ninth circles of hell made manifest in the warp. And though its surface is quickly discovered to be anathema to natural life, it is still absolutely plastered by warp children, like horrors, screamers, zangors, and the same demons from Warhammer Fantasy that we all know and love, whose hideous cries fill the air as they coalesce into existence and then disperse once again. And in the center of it all, Tizka plops down and once again becomes the seat of power for Magnus and his sons. Now we haven't talked much about Ahriman yet, but we can't really discuss the Thousand Sons without covering their chief librarian. Even in the early days of the 31st millennium, Ahriman was an incredibly gifted psyker, so much so in fact, that he rose to become the Magister Templi of the Corvide cult. He was a confidant and right-hand man of Magnus the Red. Think of him as Abaddon to Horus, Karn to Angren, or Raldoran to Sanguinius. He's effectively the second most powerful and important figurehead in the Legion, although I'm sure Amon and a few others might disagree. He was the one organizing the defense of Tizka during the Space Wolves invasion, when Magnus the Red was busy jerking off the tears as lubricant and couldn't be bothered to save his sons. And it was probably at that very moment, watching as his brothers died around him, that Ahriman realized Primarchs are not these omnipotent, infallible beings that they're kind of stupid and flawed and selfish like regular humans, which planted a seed in his mind, one that would bear fruit not long after. But long before all of this happened at Prospero, Azek Ariman had a brother named Ormuzd, who had succumbed to the flesh change like so many others of his legion. And it was due in part to this fear of seeing firsthand the horrors of the flesh change, of watching as his brother mutated into an abomination with no sense or reason whatsoever, that Ariman was inspired to begin his great work. Landing on the planet of the sorcerers didn't exactly help when it came to the flesh change. If anything, it was accelerating the entire process, to the point where an already battered and broken legion was now very much in its death throes. Ariman realized that something had to be done to stop this flesh change from entirely consuming his legion, and in secret, he began a ritual to rival the one that sent Magnus to the gates of Holy Terra through the warp. This was the rubric. But to unleash this rubric of Ahriman, he needed a cabal of willing sorcerers, which was not hard to find, given the disgust many felt with both their Primarch and the flesh change that was now coursing through their ranks unabated, and he needed a tome of spells with unfathomable knowledge to aid in this task. Which he already had, the Book of Magnus, the collective works of might, magic, and sorcery written by the Crimson King himself, and Ahriman had been entrusted to keep it safe. So he already had everything he needed, and together with his cabal, he unleashed a spell that would forever cure his people of the Taint of Chaos, and allow the Thousand Suns to pursue their own destiny in the galaxy. But the results were not what was expected. For one, this was a cataclysmic undertaking. Even the demons of Zinch on Sorciaris were pooping their pants when Ahriman started this baby up. I mean, it was the kind of spell that could wipe them out of existence forever, scouring them from the warp and obliterating their very souls. So they wanted no part of it whatsoever. Magnus was unaware of what was going down, and Legion at large had no idea it was happening either. So when the rubric started, and bolts of purifying light rained down under a shaking sky, the cabal of psychers who could deal with this much raw energy felt their power swollen to insane levels, augmented to a point never before seen amongst humanity. But for the majority, the ones who couldn't handle this avalanche of warp energy, they were obliterated on impact, burned to ashes within their power armor. And yet, it was not the end for the rank and file of the Thousand Sons, because even though like 90% of the Legion had just been warp toasted and killed outright, they were not dead. Not truly, anyway. Their souls had been fused inside their power armor, unable to escape into the warp when their bodies were destroyed, and what remained was a dust zombie, effectively, an automaton that would heed the orders of its Psyker overlords, but lacked the speed, intelligence, or free will of the battle brother it once was. 
a creature as resilient and indestructible as the Plague Marines of Nurgle, caught between death and unlife, unchanging for all eternity, a puppet in the games of the Great Deceiver. So Ahriman succeeded in his own way. He purified the Legion in the Holy Fires of Zeench, preventing their corruption from manifesting into further mutation, because Rubric Marines could not be affected by disease or decay or turn into a gibbering freak. So a job well done, I guess, right? But the Legion had lost its soul, and for many, including Ahriman, that was maybe too high a price to pay. And Magnus would have killed him for it too, outright, but instead, Zinch convinced him not to do so, and instead banished him and a bunch of his Psyker buddies from the Thousand Suns forever, sending them into exile to learn the unknowable, to fully understand the changer of ways and his nature, which is an impossible task, of course. And so, Ahriman is still doing that to this day. Fast forward to the 41st millennium, and Ahriman has become the most powerful Psyker in the galaxy, outside Demon Prince Magnus, of course, the skeleton of the Emperor, and maybe Eldred Ulthran. But he has fallen oh so far from the ideals that made him who he was. He is treacherous, murderous, and loyal to no one, a creature for whom the ends justify the means always and forever. Mighty beyond measure, but a hollow shell of the man he once was, although he'd rather die than admit it. He founded his own splinter group and chaos warband called the Prodigal Sons, and has spent almost all of his time searching for the Black Library of Chaos, the greatest repository of knowledge in the galaxy. And on occasion, when the prize is big enough, he works together with his buddy Demon Prince Magnus, like when they teamed up in the name of Vengeance to blast apart Fenris, home of the Space Wolves, ten millennia after their own homeland was glassed, or when they work side by side to translate the planet of the Sorcerers out of the Eye of Terror and into orbit above the dead surface of Prospero. Yeah, they teleported a planet, millions of light years. Like I said, when the plot isn't dicking them over, Thousand Suns are stupidly overpowered. By the way, for anyone wondering why Chaos characters that were around 10,000 years before the current timeline are still alive in present day, it's because the warp makes time meaningless, and anyone who makes their home in the Eye of Terror doesn't care about getting old at all. I think the oldest non-dreadnought on the loyalist side of the conflict is Lord Commander Dante of the Blood Angels, and he's only like 1500 years old. The Lion and Robot Girly Man are Primarchs, and they're still around obviously, but both spent a good 9,000 years in stasis. So. Space Marines have a changing of the guard relatively often in terms of their main characters, but Chaos Space Marines have the same homies still hanging around 10 millennia later, and pretty much all the important characters there took part in the Horus Heresy in one way or another. There's a lot more we could get into on the lore side of things, but there's still the Lords, Army, Units, and Tactics part we have to discuss in this video, so I think we'll shift gears now. We know all about their past, but what about their present? How did the Thousand Suns prosecute warfare in the current timeline? Well, in the 41st millennium, the Thousand Suns are a fractured legion, governed by a cabal of incredibly powerful wizards. Their warbands operate as independent entities, carving a bloody swath through Imperial space at the whim of the Psykers who lead them, only coming together in times of great import like the Scouring of Fenris or during Abaddon's Black Crusades. And this is not unique to the Brothers of Zinch. It characterizes basically every single founding legion on the Chaos side of the conflict. When their Primarchs died or ascended, when Horus and his rebellion failed, and the forces of Chaos retreated into the Eye of Terror, Chaos did what Chaos always does. They turned chaotic. They don't think it be like it is, but it do. Every single badass who thought they were the best made a power grab, civil war erupted throughout each and every traitor legion, and even the Primarchs like Mortarion couldn't stop huge sections of their army from abandoning the cause. 10,000 years later, and they're still picking up the pieces left over from the Territory Wars in the Eye of Terror. And in many ways, the Thousand Suns are in a better position than many of the other traitor legions in the 41st millennium. From the standpoint of recovering from losses, their rubrique are almost functionally immortal, able to be repaired and called back to their armored prison, even if their dust is scattered to the four winds, which is incredibly difficult to do in and of itself because of the psychic wards that protect each rubric marine. They don't have to steal Gene Seed, pirate for parts, or scramble for survival, quite like the Night Lords or many of the other forces of Chaos, because their sorcerers do the heavy lifting. No matter how badly a Rubric Marine might get messed up, like a loving mother, a Psyker without any conscience whatsoever will be along to tuck them back into their hellish, hollow existence and sing them a lullaby of change. The trade-off, though, is that their numbers are absolutely tiny, and always have been, 
compared to the forces of the Imperium or even their own chaotic brothers. So they rely heavily on demons and cultists to a far greater extent than you might see out of the Night Lords or World Eaters. And as we know, cultists can be a bit unreliable, especially when they're slave to the Lords of Change. As for the Thousand Suns themselves, they are drawn to places of eldritch power like moths to a flame, stealing ancient artifacts and ripping open warp portals to commune with demons in a bid to learn of the future. Almost to a man, they are driven by an insatiable lusting for arcane might, and in a galaxy with billions of planets with a B, there are many places to obtain it. So they march to war under the grinding boots of the Rubriquet, implacable on the attack, indomitable in defense, able to shrug off even the most dire of wounds and keep plowing forward. It's strange because you don't usually attribute tankiness or resilience to anything Zinchi. Kind of always think of them as squishy nerds, right? But alongside Plague Marines, Rubric Marines are the most survivable rank and file space marine in the entire setting. And it makes sense from both a lore and a tabletop perspective because they're literally made of dust. There's no flesh and blood to be ripped asunder when something manages to punch through their armor. Also, there's the All is Dust special rule to consider, which used to give them a ward save, and is pretty common among Zinch units in both 40k and Fantasy, giving them some deflection type of tactic that allows them to avoid incoming damage. But it is only through anarchy and upheaval that the will of Zinch is made manifest, and word of their coming can send entire systems into a frenzy. In the vanguard of their invasions come the howling cries and mewling screams of Zinch and his demonic legions, as Zangors, Horrors and Screamers mow down all in their path with fire. Inferno Bolters and Arcane Flamers envelop their enemies in the flames of change, purifying them in the eyes of their lord, as demon engines racked by mutation and possessed by foul entities meld man and machine in profane rituals, ripping a terrible path of destruction through any foolish enough to stand in their way. And through it all, march the Sekhmet, the Scarab Occult Terminators, veteran undead in massive warplate, forged by the flames of the rubric and wielding power kopeshes that can slice a predator tank in half. But psychic might is at the very core of the Thousand Suns and how they do battle, and that hasn't changed for 10,000 standard years. A single Chaos Space Marine Librarian can pose a threat to an entire sector if it's the right one at the right time, but when a cabal of Thousand Sun Psychers are all unleashed on the battlefield together, there are few forces in the galaxy that can withstand their psychic assault and those who can often get screwed over anyway. There are stories of their librarians and demon princes dying in the clutches of a champion of the false emperor only for time to rewind over and over and over again until fate intervenes and allows them to win their duel. They're not above cheating, so to fight against the warriors of Zinch is to watch helplessly as the space-time continuum unravels and does everything in its power to make you lose. And in the end, when your allies are dead and dying, your souls are ripped from their mortal coil and are enslaved in the warp for eternity. Sounds like a good time. Needless to say, the years have not been kind to our Thousand Suns brethren, and in turn, they show little kindness themselves when they enter the mortal plane. Now, when we're talking about their translation to the battlefields of Total War Warhammer 40k, this is not a launch day race. As I've said in previous videos, I think the Black Legion and Red Corsairs make a lot of sense, with Abaddon the Despoiler and Huron Blackheart leading the charge for Chaos. The Chaos God specific factions like the Emperor's Children, World Eaters, Death Guard, and Thousand Sons can come later as DLC and expansion material. But this is a faction with overwhelming ranged firepower and a surprising amount of resilience a faction that relies heavily on finesse, trickery, and manipulation, in comparison to the straightforward tactics of many of their CSM peers. And it should come as no surprise. They're like Indie Pride from Milk and Cookie Total War. They're the best casters in the galaxy, baby, so that psychic potential certainly needs to be represented in video game form. On the tabletop, they have quite a few special rules that could make it into Total War, either as campaign mechanics, passives, or in-battle abilities. Death to the False Emperor is the main rule that all Chaos Forces share, representing the seething hatred Chaos Space Marines harbor for the Corpse Emperor and his weakling Imperium. And this hatred is a weapon unto itself, so on a hit roll of 6 up, you can make an extra attack against Imperial Forces on the tabletop. It's interesting because up to this point, Creative Assembly haven't really translated hatred mechanics from Warhammer Fantasy into battle abilities in any way, shape, or form. We've seen glimpses of it on the skill tree for some lords, but the mechanic has largely been ignored. Time for that to change, because 40k is a setting where these rivalries run just as deep, if not deeper, 
a setting where entire planets and trillions of lives and 10 millennia have all run together and seen millions, billions, trillions of people all been snuffed out due to the predations of other races, like the Eldar and Slanesh, who both have special rules that represent their hostility towards one another. Time to make that kind of stuff matter in combat. So Death to the False Emperor would be an increase in melee attack and ranged hit chance when engaging Imperial forces. Demonic Ritual is the second special rule, allowing any Thousand Suns character to summon a Zeech Demon unit instead of moving during their turn. And this one is fairly straightforward, I think. Give them a bound spell that lets them poop out a unit of Horrors, Screamers, Flamers, or Zangors, and that's all there is to it. Nothing too complex there. Well, I guess maybe not Zangors, because they're not technically a demon unit, but I'm not actually sure in Tabletop if you're able to summon Zangors the way you can demons. I imagine they wouldn't be part of the Demonic Ritual because they're technically ab-humans, but we'll talk a little bit more about Zangors later. Now, the Brotherhood of Sorcerer special rule means that the range of all psychic powers in your armies are increased substantially when multiple characters are massed on the field. So your smites and bolts of zinch and bound spells can travel further and have a larger radius than those of psychers from other legions. Each of their Rubric Marines units is led by a psyker as well, which means even their standard rank and file have basic bound spells as part of their unit abilities. And their All is Dust special rule does two pretty important things. It gives all Rubrique and Segment forces a ward save, contributing to their already pretty impressive survivability, and allows them to fire accurately with heavy weapons like a Soul Reaper cannon when advancing, which most Space Marine units cannot do. Now their demons are literally the same thing in 40k as they are in Fantasy. Horrors, Screamers, Flamers, if you've seen my Zinch Lore Army and Tactics video for Warhammer Fantasy, you know all about them and all about their special rules. We don't need to dive into them again. But we can talk about Zongors, which play a massive role in current Thousand Suns lore. These are essentially blessed beasts of the Bray Herd who align themselves with Zinch. Not technically demons, but certainly sharing quite a few similarities. And what we've got here is a wild fusion of bestial ferocity, avian agility, and human cunning. The shock troops and tar pits that jump first into the fray, soaking up damage while the big guns do the heavy lifting. Strong enough to represent a threat to any mortal that gets in their way, but cheap enough for psychers to not really care if they die or be fearful that they might be destroyed. And just like the Beastmen, they have a pretty terrifying habit of being born to human mothers. In the wake of the Cicatrix Maledictum, the gigantic warp storm that severed the galaxy in half, entire planets have fallen in their shadow as generations of Zangors are born and quickly overrun the surface world. The Zangor Enlightened are their chosen, essentially, wielding divining spears and fate caster great bows, sending in sorcered weapons into the bowels of their enemies. And Zangor Shamans are the final step in their evolution, their heroic counterpart, riding discs of Zinch and wielding powers from the discipline of change, their unique lore of magic in 40k. As generic lord choices, they have access to demon princes of Zinch and exalted sorcerers. But funnily enough, no lords of change, no greater demons of Zinch, which frankly, I think should change when Total War 40k finally happens. I think it'd be kind of weird to create a Thousand Suns faction and not let them have a full demon-themed army, even though just like in Fantasy, I do expect a Demons of Chaos faction to make it in the game at some point as well. All the other Zinch demons are already in the roster, so I don't think Big Bird should miss out either. Now, as we know from Warhammer Fantasy, Demon Princes of Zinch are world-ending forces of nature, blending horrifying melee potential with their malefic talons and hellforged weaponry, with Sorceress Might on par with the greatest psychers of other legions. With a 20% ward save, great mobility, and insane battlefield output, magical damage and single-target spells would be by far the most effective way to take them down before they rip a skyscraper-sized hole through your armies if you're playing against them. We'll be seeing a lot of Demon Prince action come Warhammer 3, and we'll get a much better idea of how they can be translated and what they're capable of on the battlefields of Total War once we see them in action there. Exalted Sorcerers are much the same way, but instead of a Frankenstein monstrosity from the Void, we have the Psyker Elite, an Astarte swollen by the arcane power of the Warp. Just a generic version of Ariman, essentially, with a ton of customization options to boot. A powerful Thousand Suns caster lord riding a disc of zinch, raining down fires of change, and cackling with glee. Now for the rank and file, Rubric Marines are the backbone of this legion, the cursed automatons of the Thousand Suns, and one of the two toughest infantry units that are available to the traitor legions, right alongside their Nurglite rifles, the Plague Marines. They serve a similar tactical role to Plague Marines, 
they're absolutely tough as balls, hard to bring down, but whereas the Plague Marines can easily resist massed infantry fire, Rubric Marines are protected by Dark Sorcery that grants them a ward save, and they can potentially shrug off even the most powerful hits from anti-tank weaponry. Inarguably the coolest looking rank and file amongst the Space Marine Legions, Loyalist or Traitor, outside the possible inclusion of Corn Berserker World Eaters. They can be armed with Inferno Bolt Guns, Warp Flamers, or the Soul Reaper Heavy Auto Cannon, weapons blessed by Zinch that can melt through power armor like it doesn't even exist. So essentially, these are armor-piercing weapons meant to hard counter other Space Marine Legions, and that's one thing Zinch does exceptionally well, is tear through armor from long range. Advancing next to them are the Scarab Occult Terminators of the Sekhmet, the Terminator Elite who come standard with a 20% ward save. These are amongst the best Space Marine Terminators in the entirety of 40k, with more durability and better punching power from range, and like the Rubrique, they can advance while shooting without accuracy penalties. They can be equipped with Hellfire Missile Racks for anti-vehicle work, or Warp Flamers, Combi Bolters, and Soul Reaper Cannons for shredding infantry and light transport apart. Now I will say, Deep Striking is going to be a very important mechanic to get right in Total War Warhammer 40k, Thankfully, the blueprint is already there, so I don't think its implementation will be too difficult, but this is a core tactic of both the Imperium and the Forces of Chaos. And Deep Striking is the bee's knees. I mean, the ability to teleport or drop pod into battle from off-screen is downright essential. I think Dawn of War 3 had the right idea on how to implement it. You recruit a unit, then designate your plan to Deep Strike them in the pre-battle screen placing them inside a drop pod or teleport array, and spending a few command points to do so. And when the time comes, just like you do in Warhammer 2 with Feral Cold Ones or Summons, you click a point on the battlefield, and the unit drops feet first into hell, ready for a fight. There is nothing that screams 40k better than a drop pod slamming down from overhead, flattening a unit or terrain, then spitting out a bunch of TAC Marines or Terminator Squad, and they just start firing and mowing everything down in their path. Implementing Deep Striking correctly would go a long way in bringing the battlefields of the 41st Millennium to life and open up a lot of interesting tactics and flanking opportunities for the player as well. And the Scarab Occult would be amongst your best Deep Strikers in the faction, simply because of their resilience and firepower they can bring to bear. Now alongside Zongors, Cultists are your meat shields and marauders, meant to drown the enemy in a tide of blood and corpses while that patented Zinch Daka line goes to work. And Chaos Spawn will be the monstrous infantry that supports their onslaught as Mutilith Vortex Beasts unleash their insane magics from the back line. But now we start getting into the technological marvels and freaks of nature that Zinch can unleash. The demon engines and rumbling weapons of war that signal a thousand suns thrall band on the path to bloodshed. Hellbrutes are the chaos equivalent of a dreadnought, twisted and psychotic single entity walkers trapped inside an adamantium sarcophagus, unable to claim the sweet release of death. So they unleash their fury on any who stand in their way, wielding multi melta, las cannon, and twin linked heavy bolters. Driven insane by their eternal torture, they are exactly the type of unit you'd expect to rampage and fire indiscriminately at enemies, and they can lay down the suppressing fire of an entire rubric squad all by themselves. Providing overwatch for the boots on the ground are the Helldrakes, gigantic demon engines forged in the likeness of dragons from ancient Terran myth. They hang like monstrous bats from the bottom of Chaos warships during warp translation, and when an invasion begins, they dive through the atmosphere, clearing the way for drop pods and transport ships as they assert aerial dominance. Infernal regeneration replenishes any health they lose during combat, and if an opponent is lucky enough to take one down, their crash and burn special rule can take out an entire regiment of Imperial Guard as it collapses to the ground. This is a powerful armored flyer, built for both range and melee, able to use strafing runs like breath attacks of Hades autocannon fire, then follow their salvos up with a fierce charge and rending talons. Land Raiders, Predators, Rhinos, and Vindicator tanks are exactly what they sound like. They are Heavy tanks, mobile artillery that can transport entire squadrons of Rubrique, or drop devastating levels of suppressing fire while they advance in the vanguard of your formations. These are your anti-cover, anti-building, and anti-vehicle tools, designed to slash through even the heaviest tanks with preternaturally accurate last fire, or melt away hordes of onrushing enemies with bursts of combi flamer and demolisher cannon. Tank warfare will be amongst the biggest departures from the standard Total War formula we've ever had up to this point, 
and it's something that we'll discuss more in depth in our four-part Total War 40k series, but I really just don't think it's remotely out of the realm of possibility to get working properly. As I've said many times, this game will have a much heavier emphasis on terrain, shooting, and cover than we've ever seen before, but the blueprint for most of this stuff already exists. If Creative Assembly can get steam tanks working, they can do the same for Predators and Vindicators no problem. And the beauty of 40k, when it comes to the perspective of a Total War developer anyway, is that once one Space Marine, or once one Chaos Space Marine faction is created, the foundation is there for all time. Every single chapter or legion that comes after can branch off that same framework, using the same skeletons and models that have already been finished. And there are dozens of these kind of factions that people want to play as, that they would love to play as, that have their own unique aesthetic, playstyle, and special rules, but still come from the same standard template, still have mostly the same rosters, barring some visual changes in a handful of unique units and legendary lords. So if you're a developer, you're licking your lips at the opportunity that affords. And I'll say right now, if you think the DLC and free LC cycle for Total War Warhammer is ridiculous, you ain't seen nothing yet. 40k will take that to a whole nother level, and that could be a good or bad thing, but mostly I'd say it's good. The more content we get, the happier I think most of us will be. But to finish up with the rest of the Thousand Suns roster, we'll end on the Defiler, the Forge Fiend, and the Mauler Fiend. Now the Forge Fiend, or the Daka Fiend as it's more commonly known, is a Dark Mechanicum demon engine the size of a house, armed with two Hades auto cannons for blasting apart armored infantry from long range. They take the shape of an almost prehistoric centaur, possessed by a savage animal intelligence, and they are brutal from downtown. And the Mauler Fiend is its even more diabolical brother, preferring to rip and tear in CQB with lasher tendrils and magma cutters up close and personal. But interesting thing about them and many similar monstrosities in 40k is that they get weaker the more damage they take, which is something CA should heavily consider with single entities as they move on to Warhammer 3. Maybe make the penalties for exhaustion on stuff like Star Dragons, Dragon Ogre Shagus, and the like, make the penalties for their exhaustion less severe, but force a stat decrease at certain HP thresholds as that creature loses blood. It's a really effective way to balance how good single entities can get in the late game when they're cycle charging and causing terror all over the battlefield. And finally, the Defiler is a chaos murder crab, robot murder crab, walking around like an Armageddon arthropod with a massive assortment of heavy weaponry and renowned for their ferocity and power by the sacrifice of a live loyalist space marine with a bound demon at its core. So they'll capture an ultramarine or a raven guard and they will shove them into the center of this crab and sacrifice them and bring a demon to bind to the demon engine itself. Pretty nasty stuff there. Now, I find it unlikely all these demon engines and tanks make it in the game, at least on launch day. I think they'd get a bit redundant, but the nice thing about Chaos is that once one of these units is created, it's there for every other Chaos army in the game. It just requires some recoloring and a few unique bells and whistles to make it clear which legion it belongs to. Obviously, it remains to be seen how Creative Assembly would handle something like 7, 8, 10 different Chaos Legions, which ideally is how they'd want to do it, but there's a lot more variety, a lot more flavor between the Chaos rosters in 40k when compared to Fantasy, and there are a lot more special rules and Codex compliant armies as well. And by Codex compliant, I mean they actually have Codexes or special rules. So we've talked about their unit roster and how the Thousand Suns prosecute warfare in the present, but we need to discuss mechanics and characters from the source material that could leave a big imprint on Total War Warhammer 40,000. And I think stratagems are by far one of the best ways to introduce new and unique mechanics to the campaign and battlefields of Total War. Stratagems are a feature straight from the tabletop that give each faction more choices on how to build and customize their armies on the fly. And these would be a set of abilities you can pick and choose in the pre-battle screen for custom and multiplayer and unlock in campaign, that allow you to alter and augment your tactics in flavorful and exciting ways. So for example, in a previous video, we discussed the unique Red Corsair stratagem called More Where They Came From, allowing a severely damaged unit of Chaos Space Marines to be replaced by a healthy one. Every race in the game would have a set amount of command points to buy unique stratagems before a battle, but certain races like the Eldar and the Red Corsairs specialize in generating CP and would have more to spend at the start of a match that can get these unique abilities. So the stratagems I'd like to see most for the Thousand Suns are Webway Infiltration, 
which allows you to deep strike any Thousand Suns infantry unit into a flanking position, essentially summoning an entire unit of Rubric Marines in the best possible spot at the best possible time to devastate the opposition from the warp. So a big portal opens up, a bunch of Rubric Marines pour out, and they just start blasting just as planned. A bit of a nasty trick they learned in their wars for the Black Library against the Eldar and the Harlequin. And Coruscating Beam is another stratagem, which would grant your sorcerer a unique bound spell, where they create a line of Eldritch energy that would severely damage anything that walks through it, effectively denying choke points and punishing those who would dare approach it. Vengeance for Prospero is Death to the False Emperor on steroids, essentially, but only works against Space Wolves, massively boosting their hit chance against the Dogs of Rust, and could work very well as a unique passive on an Exalted Sorcerer's skill tree. So, you know you're about to invade Fenris, you know you're going to go to war with the Space Wolves, and you say, all right, let me buy this skill. I'm going to go in, and now all of my Rubik Marines have a much better hit chance against their rank and file. Exactly what you want. There are a metric crap ton of stratagems for every Codex race in 40k, and I'd hardly expect to see them all, but I think implementing at least two or three per faction would go a long way in further differentiating the playstyles of each army. Now, your starting legendary lords and factions for the Thousand Suns would be the two important characters we spent the majority of the lore section talking about. Demon Prince Magnus, who, after he was a Primarch, was ascended by Zinch to become a Demon Prince, would be leading the Thousand Suns faction from the planet of Sorciaris, and Azek Ariman would lead the Prodigal Sun sub-faction as a Horde, wandering throughout the galaxy in a bid to understand the nature of Zinch. Demon Prince Magnus, the Crimson King, is of course the Primarch of the Thousand Suns, and the most powerful psychic being in the galaxy that isn't the Emperor or a literal god. The Blade of Magnus is his special weapon, allowing him to turn any character he's killed into a gibbering chaos spawn that his army can control, which is incredibly freaking cool. And considering his absurd stat line and the fact that he hits harder than a titan, you'll be doing plenty of character killing with him anyway, both in terms of his casting output and when you're up close and personal. As Crown of the Crimson King grants a 4-up ward save, which is really the theme that binds the entire Thousand Suns roster, it essentially nullifies the possibility of causing damage to himself when miscasting, which is almost never going to happen anyway. I mean, what kind of demon prince fears the perils of the warp? He is warp energy. He is a creature of the warp. And his Gaze of Magnus grants him the Smite Power, which is like a standard magic missile, one of the most common spells in 40k, it's actually the one you see when an Eldar Warlock casts its lightning ability in Dawn of War 2, I believe that is essentially Smite. But Magnus has a special version that deals double the damage compared to normal casters. Primarch of the Thousand Suns is a special rule that can be translated as a massive cooldown reduction for his spells, and for any psychers that also happen to be standing near him, and Unearthly Power doesn't really translate to Total War, but could just give him insane wins and magic regeneration, which is very fitting for a Psyker of such cataclysmic potential. And picking him as your starting Lord would grant upkeep reductions and bonuses to the Sekhmet, his bodyguard Scarab Occult Terminators, and to demonic units of Zinch, representing the pack Demon Prince Magnus has forged with his deity Zinch himself. In a Total War Warhammer 40k campaign, he'd begin his playthrough in the Eye of Terror, near the other demon worlds of Sinesh, Korn, and Nurgle on Sorciaris. And on the flip side, we have Dr. Von Doom, Azek Ariman, the chief librarian and war leader of the Prodigal Sun Splinter faction. They'd be a horde race, floating in Eldar space at the start of their campaign, searching for clues that will lead him into the webway to find the Black Library of Chaos. Now, Ariman is hands down one of the best lord options in the Chaos arsenal overall, period not just amongst the Thousand Suns, but throughout all of their codexes. On the tabletop, he can absolutely wreck enemy characters by rolling in a goon squad of Zangor Enlightened on Discs of Zinch, blasting high-value targets with Thunderbolts and Magic Missiles with incredible mobility, and he's also pretty beastly in melee. He wields the Black Staff of Ariaman, a powerful weapon that combines arcane artifacts from the length and breadth of the Milky Way galaxy and the Immaterium at large. Now, his Arch Sorcerer of Zinch trait would grant him Bananas wins of magic potential, lowering his miscast chance and dramatically increasing the amount of spells he can unleash, especially when compared to a typical sorcerer from another faction. While the Sigil of Corruption special rule gives him that beautiful 20% ward save that so many other Zinch characters and units enjoy, 
and Lord of the Thousand Suns would increase the range damage output of any shooting infantry in his vicinity. So you roll him in a block of Scarab Occult Terminators or next to a bunch of Rubric Marines, and they're going to be dishing out even more punishment from downtown than they'd otherwise be able to. You'd have upkeep reductions for Rubric Marines and increased recruitment rank for Exalted Sorcerers as his faction effects, and have a campaign focused entirely on acquiring arcane artifacts and summoning demons into the mortal plane. Kind of what Ariman does. I think both are incredibly iconic lore choices with a lot of interesting mechanics and gameplay to bring to the table, but before we wrap this baby up, we gotta take a quick look at the disciplines for the Thousand Suns, which are the 40k equivalents of Lords of Magic, essentially. They have access to three unique disciplines on the tabletop. The Discipline of Change, the Discipline of Zinch, and the Discipline of the Dark Hereticus. We won't go over every single spell across all three lords, but there are some pretty dope highlights that I think would translate well to Total War. Temporal Manipulation allows them to heal the wounds of their allies in much the same way that a Regrowth or Earthblood would. Diabolic Strength can turn an already potent melee combatant like Demon Prince Magnus into an absolute world beater, pretty much like a Primarch of the World Eaters, by increasing his weapon damage and melee attack drastically, so he just blends everything in his path. Treason of Zinch allows you to take control of an enemy character, sending them into a horrible position to die once the effect wears off, which would probably not be very fun on the receiving end. We've talked about mechanics like that before. Rampage, Madcap, Mushrooms, all that stuff. Not fun to play against, but would be utterly hilarious to use against the AI if it wasn't already so fond of suiciding its lords anyway, so not sure how useful a mechanic like that would be, but could definitely be a fun spell. And Gifts of Chaos would grant a damage bonus to a unit, and if they dealt a certain amount of damage while that spell was active, they'd turn a few of their dead enemies into Chaos Spawn that you can control, which is pretty entertaining. So you have a bunch of ways to influence the battlefield with demonic summonings, bound spells like Doom Bolt in your Rubric Marines, crazy magical output, and some of the best long-range firepower in the setting. With the trade-off being, Rubric Marines and Scarab Occult Terminators are very slow, and you are quite reliant on your Lord and Hero choices compared to other factions, and anti-psyker armies like the Tyranids, or the Sisters of Silence, pretty terrifying right there, they can severely wreck your day. But the Thousand Sons are an incredibly unique faction, with a recognizable and attractive aesthetic, a strong theme that runs throughout the course of their legion, and some awesome units and characters to boot. Hope you guys enjoyed this look at the Thousand Sons and how they might translate to a Total War Warhammer 40k. And if you enjoyed it, give it a like. Let me know your own ideas in the comment section of which factions you'd like me to cover next. And I'll see you all in the grim dark future of the 41st millennium, which is probably when this game will actually finally come out. Hope you guys enjoyed. See you next time. Any Pride, signing out for now.